Okay. Tales of the Cock Podcast, episode four. I'm sitting here with my favorite people in the world. Um, I still don't know what to call you, though. Because <laughs> when I met you, you were a professor Piratillo. Right. You're my intro to philosophy professor at USD. I was 19, young and starry eyed. I had not had a good class at USD yet at the time. I, I felt um, I was very behind in all of them, you know? I was struggling. I took your class and loved it so much. Something about it, I don't know, something about the way you talked, the, um, the way you taught. I got it. I did very well in your first class. Yeah. So much so that I took, how many classes? Three? Three, Three classes with you, as many as I could. <laughs> and I remember you very well. I mean, I always did. But I remember you in that very first class. The intro class, yeah. Yeah, because you were, you were awake, you know. Yeah. You were alive in that class. For the first time, like I hadn't, I took calculus before that and did terribly. Took astronomy and loved it, but didn't do well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what other classes I've been doing at the time. I don't think I'd done accounting yet, but um, yeah, I loved it so much. And so at the time, you're Professor Piricello, but now I still see you. I, I go um, every Monday night. We meet up at uh, a Zen center of sorts. Well, what's a proper name for it? It is. It's a Zen center or a Zen community. A Zen community. Um, and we do it on the, the home temple model, so that people aren't aren't going to, a, you know, something that they might imagine, you know, some kind of structure or church-like building. Right. We're doing it in a private home, and that's that's kind of the model of, uh, of a lot of Zen in the U.S. Cause Basically, people don't want to be out there doing fundraisers. Uh -huh. They want to do Zen. They want to practice Zen. Right. And so a lot of these, um, a lot of the Zen teaching and training is going on in private homes. Right. And so when we come to this place every Monday night, mm -hmm. um, your name is Annie Sensei, mm -hmm. which really throws me off because <laughs> Professor Piracilla to Annie Sensei is quite a big jump. And so every time I, like, I you know, we've emailed correspond a couple times. I never know how to start it. So yeah. <laughs> I think the past couple times have been Annie Sensei, Professor Piratello. <laughs> you know, when I see some of my old professors <clears throat> from, you know, 30 some years ago or whatever, I still have a hard time. You know, like there's one, I have a really hard time calling him Joe. Right. You know, right. because he was, you know, Professor so-and-so for so many years. Right. So it's those role changes that can really throw us. Yeah, 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 very true. And then so today, we're sitting here in your beautiful apartment in La Jolla, California. We're drinking some tea. This is a Shung Pur that I bought um, very quickly into my time in Taiwan. When I showed up, I told you a little bit before we started, um, that I studied tea at this place in Taiwan called the Tea Sage Hut. Mm -hmm. And it's just a great place. Um, just a guy who's dedicated his life to tea and spirituality. So every morning they wake up and meditate. And they have a very healthy breakfast. Then they drink tea for a couple hours, and then the day starts. Then they'd go to work, or you know, work at the center, help guests, whatever needs to be done. But um, when I was there, the first time I met the um, the head honcho, his name is Wuda. He um, offered me a very good price on some tea. It was five cakes of tea, four hundred gram cakes. Uh -huh for $125, which if you go around here, one cake, you cannot find one cake for $125. That's like, so I got essentially four cakes for free after the first one was cheap. And so this tea, um, the way I think of it, is it's very pure. It's straight from Bodhidharma's eyelid, <laughs> which, is, um, which is why I asked you to put this little guy here. <laughs> Because a lot of people listening, they don't quite know Bodhidharma. Um, well, what would you say is his significance? He's the, the first patriarch of Zen. He's huge for the, the, the identity of the Chan, Son, Zen school, schools or family of uh, tradition. And, you know, you made a reference to his, to his eyelids. You know, one of the stories about Bodhidharma is that he ripped off his eyelids so that he could you know, meditate so he wouldn't, you know, wouldn't go to sleep and so on. And some people even think he brought tea to China. Right. And of course he was, the story is that he's from India. And, uh, but yeah, he's quite important to the whole 
family of Zen tradition? The way I heard the story is he's meditating. And he just wants to be enlightened so badly. He falls asleep and gets so upset. He rips off his eyelids because they're betraying him, <laughs> throws it in the ground, and out of that came the first tea plant, <laughs> which is um, the area would be the southwest of China, which is where Pur comes from. Oh. That's, um, it's the only type of tea uh, linked to an area. For all the other types of tea, mm-hmm. green tea can be grown in China, Taiwan, Japan, mm-hmm. Korea. Uh, Hawaii has some good green tea. Black tea is similar. Poor is the only one named after the area. In the same way you can't have like American champagne mm-hmm. isn't a thing, mm-hmm. right? That does, it's not. Um, yeah, so Poor is the only one like that. And so this would be the area that he would have come from, I guess, if he came from India. And so it's a very good linkage. Tea for you. Thank you. So, now that you're a Zen sensei, it's safe to assume uh, you've been uh, you've been doing this a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've been meditating for a long time. Yeah, since about 1980. Since 1980. Yeah. Long before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> that was about I was negative 11 in 1980. <laughs> so, how long have you been a, a formal? Or I guess I should even ask like, what's, what's the way to talk about it? You're a, a formalized sensei, you're indoctrinated. <laughs> well, what they call it is Dharma transmission. You've received and, Dharma transmission. Yeah, and one of the more technical names is Shiho. Shiho. I, I went through a ceremony called the, the Shiho ceremony, and that's the actual formal Dharma transmission ceremony given in, at least in this Japanese, it's actually a mixed tradition mixture of Soto and Rinzai because my teacher's teacher, Majumi Roshi, um, was taught by and sort of given certification by three different teachers. And one was his father who was a Soto teacher and another was uh, Yasutani Roshi who came through who you know, also had studied in both Soto and Rinzai schools. And then uh, thirdly, um, he was given Inca by a uh, a, a Rinzai uh, lay uh, Zen master, Koryo Roshi. And so all three of those lines of teaching and certification, um, you know, have come together in Maizumi Roshi, which Mm -hmm. he passed on to my teacher and, and many, many other people. So... I'm sort of in this lineage that is very mixed. Right, and I know I've looked into the differences between Soto and Rinzai before, mm-hmm. and I don't, I didn't get it. They yeah, seem very I'm similar. Sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I get it either. Okay. Because, I mean, one sort of, if you read textbooks about Zen, they'll say, well, the Rinzai, you know, people use koan for um, training, and so on and it, but it's much more complicated than that because right. you'll also find a real appreciation for koan in in, in the Soto school too. And so I'm sure there, if anyone's listening, which mm-hmm. I always assume they're not, but um, <laughs> if anyone's listening, yeah, exactly. Um, so we're throwing out a lot of words. Um, so w- w- what is a koan? What, what do you mean by that? Well, you say koans are very important to Zen practice. Yeah, yeah. Koan is. Um, I don't know. I I like to think of them. I mean, I could give you sort of a historical um, rundown on them, although I'm not sure I know all the details. But they're 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 a, a koan is a device for helping someone to see into how they are binding themselves with their attitudes, with their values, with the way they think, the way they act, and so on. And so they, they show up as like little pieces of text. They can be, could be a line from a poem. Uh, very often they're dialogues between um, some, you know, maybe uh, Tang, era, Tang era Chan teacher, uh, Chinese Zen, 
uh, and his student, or it can be a dialogue between a whole group of um, old Chan teachers or, or monks. And the point of using them is the teacher gives a student a koan to sit with, to work with. And the point is to sort of penetrate the point of a koan and then to demonstrate that point to the teacher. And of course, everybody, when people start koan practice, they think that, you know, if they think about it, if they apply all their, you know, their problem solving skills to it, they'll be able to penetrate the koan and answer the koan and give, give a passing answer to the teacher. But koans are sort of designed to frustrate that. Right, right. <laughs> that aspiration. The way I've always thought of a koan, it's a very illogical riddle. Mm -hmm. A lot of riddles you can just reason your way through. Maybe you can look at the words and come through them. Um, but I know, uh, so I, I've been, I guess I could say I've been practicing Zen for a couple of years now mm -hmm. with you and by myself. I've been reading texts about it. But only recently did I get my first koan. It was, um, you know, I mentioned earlier we meet on Monday nights. There's uh, a guy there who I meet with every week, Barry Roshi. Mm -hmm. He gave me my first koan, which is for the listeners to give you an example. Um, my koan is, how do you stop the sound of the temple bells? Which is so frustrating, because like, how do you stop sound? Why would you do that? <laughs> Why are you stopping the sound? Uh -huh. How can you stop sound? Uh -huh. which and is, so you see where your mind went with that. Exactly. And so I guess one of these years I'll, I'll come to some realization through it. And the way um, that I've been told to go about this is while meditating, which really is like the heart of Zen mm -hmm. practice, is yeah. just you know, there's all these other things going on. There's all these meetings and books you can read. But it's essentially just meditate and go from there. That's how I think of Zen anyway. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's an oversimplification. Well, even, no, even historically, that's right. I mean, it's a school that grew up around meditative practices rather than, say, um, a specific text. Mm -hmm. Like many of the other schools of, of Chinese Buddhism, they were sort of organized and identified with specific texts. Right. The, the Chan slash Zen schools, of course, use texts, refer to texts, have favorite texts, and so on. But the school was not, didn't, didn't grow up around a text. It really grew up around practices. Right. So I think it's safe to say, if you want to, um, I don't know if the word improve is right, <laughs> but if you want to follow the path of Zen, mm -hmm. uh, meditation is the most important, and then everything else might help you. And so koans um, are supposed to be brought in while you're meditating, while you're in your practice, while you, um, what, how do you say, you develop your samadhi? Is that, yeah, is that the right way to say it? Deepen your samadhi. Deepen yeah, your samadhi. Cultivate your samadhi. And, and what, what is samadhi? I've never gotten like a good... Oh. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think of it as, I would translate it just as, as sort of concentration. Sort of concentration. Yeah. Right, because I, I found that, um, you know, I've gone through periods of my life, past couple of years, where I meditate very regularly. Mm -hmm. You know, wake up in the morning, 20 minutes, I did 20 minutes this morning. But there's also periods in my life where maybe just to see how, see what happens, or some sort of um, shoot myself in the foot angle, mm -hmm. I stop meditating. Mm -hmm. I consciously say, tomorrow I will not do it. And what I found is during these times when I'm not meditating is my mind is just going everywhere. I, it's, um, it's like if you're walking a monkey and you let, let <laughs> off the leash. It's just going. It's in the trees. It's on Facebook. It's trying to read a book, but it can't. It's going here. It's going there. Conversations aren't as good. Um, even w w one uh, metric that I use for myself is eye contact. When I'm not meditating, it's very hard for me to keep eye contact with someone. Which I don't, you know, I've looked into like the reasoning behind eye contact and like why it's hard. And it's some sort of confidence thing, some sort of focus thing. I'm not sure what it is, but I have noticed that as I meditate, as I'm going about it, stand up a little straighter, <laughs> I have more purpose. Um, life just seems to simplify, you know, priorities sort themselves out in a different way, which isn't to say that life is easy. 
if you meditate, but there's a certain uh, focus to it, which I guess you say mm -hmm. is the samadhi. There's increased samadhi or yeah. deeper into samadhi. But even maybe even more casually, it, it produces, a, it can help stabilize your mind. Right. And I think you're seeing a lot of the benefits of that, you know, that as you continue in meditation practice, your mind becomes calmer, you know, and you're less sort of thrown or you're less sort of in the throes of, you know, the, the, the thoughts that are coming up or the emotional um, conditions that are sort of passing through mm -hmm. and so forth. But yeah, and you can really, you know, when you talk about the, the, the samadhi or the deep concentration, when you work on your koan, that's one of the places where you really, um, you real, you'll really be able to tell that your concentration has shifted into something much deeper. Yeah. Especially, you know, when we do retreats. Right. And we sat for several days. Um, the concentration can become so deep and so precise that it can start popping these koans or penetrating the koans fairly rapidly. Right, and I, I just did my first uh, retreat with you a couple of months back. Mm -hmm. It was um, right after I got back from Asia. And I spent two years in Asia uh, where I didn't see you at all, obviously, and then went straight into a retreat, which is, how long were we there? Seven days out in like... Um, you know, we're saying on Monday we meet at a house, mm -hmm. but for this retreat we're at a legit Zen center. It's right. off the beaten path. It's got a couple big wood buildings. It's so quiet. It's got nice, um, you know, rock paths and things. Yeah. It, it's very much what you would think of as a Zen center. And so while we're there, how, how much meditating do we do? Eight hours a we day? Do, uh, somewhere around there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we've changed it over the years because, you know, some of us have gotten older. <laughs> we're, we, we're not getting up quite as early as we used to, oh. <laughs> you know. Um, but we're still putting in quite a few hours every day. Right. And when I talk to people about this, I try to explain, like, like oh, what did you do on your Zen retreat? And mostly just meditate. Like, what do you mean? You sit there quietly and for about eight hours. And the, the first word that people always say is boring. Uh -huh. They think, oh, that must be so boring. But when you're there, there's not a dull moment. There's really not. Because when you're meditating, um, the thing that most people think about is trying to stop your mind, right? That's what uh, like people who haven't dove into the path yet, that's mm -hmm. the impression they get. That's what I used to hear. Mm -hmm. That's what people still tell me is like, Oh, you can just turn off your mind? I just can't do that. <laughs> and that's kind of like the first joke of meditation is that nobody can. You can't just, no one is, can just sit down and turn it off. Mm -hmm. The mind's just going. You're alive. You're alive. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <Yeah. laughs> and so when you're there, you're meditating all day. Um, maybe you can try to turn off your mind and then just realize it's impossible and then you go from there. And so when I was there, it was a big transition period in my life, right? I'd just come back from Asia. I didn't really have a plan um, for what I was going to do. But I knew I was going to San Diego, and I had a lot of work to do. So during that time, I was told to count my breath, right? Mm -hmm. That's a very simple meditative practice. Mm -hmm. For anyone listening who wants to start meditating, I'd say it's a good place to start, right? Mm -hmm. Just sit down. Every time you exhale, count one, two, all the way up to ten, and then restart. And this is very good because as the mind wanders, as it does, the monkey off the leash is just going. Mm -hmm. You count the breath, and that just brings you back, just focuses on something. And I, the, the way it makes sense to me is that the act of focusing on anything is like, uh, like weight training, mm -hmm. in the sense that when you weight training, you're not training to lift a weight necessarily you're training to lift um, you know for me like an opponent in wrestling and jujitsu mm -hmm. football player you're not training to move the sled you're training to move the guy in the other team in the same way that when you're counting your breath you're not trying to get good at counting breath you're trying to get good at focusing when the time comes 
you know, maybe you have to sit down, maybe you have to read a book, maybe you have to write a book. Um, so you're just, just training to focus on that. Living life, yeah. Yeah. I like the analogy with the weight training because you're not, well, it's conceivable. One is not training just to, to lift uh, heavy weights, but to be able to, to go through your life and be prepared and have the strength to do what's necessary. Mm -hmm. And Zen training is a lot like that. It's, it's about living your life and being better prepared to live your life. Right. And I think you told me before, like, when you go on these things, it's almost inadvisable to have that become your life. Just sit in the mountain, just sit and meditate. That's not the point. That's not even recommended, really. It's not. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. They, they sometimes I collect images um, that suggests this this idea that you know you're on some sort of linear path, and then you're going to have some you know big experience, and then suddenly you've arrived at some final place. You're and, enlightened. You know, There's yay, no more work to you're do. You're enlightened, and then you can you know I don't know sit on a mountaintop and. Um, you reach enlightenment, no longer have taxes, yeah, no you're not lonely. <laughs> nothing like that, no relationship problems. And, and not hungry that. anymore, but, you sleep well. <laughs> but yeah, as you were suggesting, that's certainly that's not how I think about it, and that's certainly not how the, the family of Zen traditions has, um, has conceived or... or um, promoted um, Zen practice. You know, this is one of the reasons why when we go on retreat, we do a lot of other things besides sitting meditation. We do work practice, where we're cleaning, we cook our meals, um, we make sure that our space is in good order, mm -hmm. um, we do walking meditation and so forth. And these are really important practices because what they are about, in part, is allowing us to integrate um, practice with our daily life, with the daily things we do, going to the grocery store, making lists, interacting with people, you know, uh, cooking, all the things we need to do to take care of our life. Right. Yeah. I remember when I was here on this most recent session, I, I was faced with two impossible tasks. First one was during the work practice. Um, I was given a big rock, <laughs> huge rock, way too big to lift. There's three of us on the task. All three of us could not lift it. It was very, very heavy. And our task was to dig a hole and bury this rock so one inch showed. Oh. The point being that it, it will serve as a footpath. Mm -hmm. Just a very nice rock. You know, walk this way, step on here first. And. Um, it was so impossible. We, we dug for six days, had no idea what we were doing, very little assistance from um, you know, the, the very nice woman who lives at the retreat center. Yeah, I she's the caretaker and she's the caretaker. Yeah. yeah, and so it was very impossible, but we did it. Mm -hmm. We figured it out and got it done. And then my second impossible task was to make oatmeal for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so during the morning meditation, I'd have to you know, bow out early and go, and I was tasked with uh, making a large amount of oatmeal and getting breakfast all prepared for everyone. And in my life, I have, I've made oatmeal like three times ever. Mm -hmm. I, just I guess it's just because I grew up spoiled, you know, I had a mom who likes doing things for me. And, uh, you know, I went to USD, which has the most ridiculous on-campus food, food situation I've ever seen. It's like a buffet on a cruise, mm -hmm. you know, very easy to eat there. Mm -hmm. And then I lived in Taiwan, which is like one of the cheapest places to eat out. So I, I've never cooked for myself, really. And so I set with the task of cooking for everyone else. And so it's very beneficial in that way. And I, I really like that part of it. You know, you're not just sitting, you're getting skills. Yeah. Sometimes that's out of necessity. Like someone, else, someone had to make oatmeal. That's right. And, you know, one, one of the ways you talk about the kind of liberation that is associated with Zen is you talk about being able to move in the ten directions. So whatever is needed 
you know, whatever is, you know, life is sort of presenting you with a, a task and, and something to do at any moment. It might be making oatmeal. It might be, you know, driving to the store to do the shopping. It might be, yeah, you know, doing the thing that you had to do with your rock. <laughs> or it <laughs> might be rocks. dying, you know, mm -hmm. or helping somebody else die. I mean, whatever life happens to be dishing out. Taking the tea out of the water so it doesn't get too bitter. Exactly. Um, and so, one, again, one of the, the, the kinds of um, liberations we're talking about is being able to just take the next step, whatever, you know, whatever needs to be done. And so you had this great experience of being, you know, handed this task, which you thought might be impossible for you, which you thought, oh, there's no way I can do that. And I've never probably, done it before. You probably didn't want to do it. And this is one of the great things about Zen training, is you get to be put in all these different situations, handed these different tasks, and then you get to see what your mind does with that. And all of this is happening in a very supportive container. Nobody's, you know, sort of cracking the whip. Right. You know, anybody would have stepped in to help you if you couldn't, you know, you really couldn't handle the oatmeal. Yeah. But you got this fabulous opportunity to see for yourself how you can bind yourself with certain ideas about what you can do, what you can't do, what it's your role to do, what it's not your role to do, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you get to switch. You know, the, another thing that's so great about this training, I think, is that everybody gets to switch roles. So you might be a Roshi or a Sensei and you're cleaning the toilets at one moment, and then you're giving a, you know, a Dharma talk, uh, the next, and, uh, and so the, this whole notion of, you know, hierarchy, you know, can be exploded at one moment. Um, what you think somebody's role is there can be completely exploded, and, and we have koans about that, too. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, when I was taking your class, you called this the man with no rank. Yeah. That's uh, someone who doesn't uh, put themselves in a category. Because I know uh, I, I've fallen prey to that a lot. Uh, for example, in jujitsu, um, I keep thinking, like, I'm not a strong guy. I'm not big. I'm not mm -hmm. powerful. Mm -hmm. My legs are very small. Mm -hmm. So there's a position where you're on top in jujitsu and you're crouched down and, like, it's very heavy on the legs. Oh. And I've thought for so long, like, I'll just never be able to do that. That's not me. My rank is to be on the bottom. I'm a guard player. I can strangle guys with my legs there. Why would I ever go to the top? This past weekend, however, it was my first jiu-jitsu tournament in a while. And I was on top almost the whole time, passing guards, doing very well, only because I forgot mm -hmm. that I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I removed myself from that, the, the uh, place I'd put myself in. Yeah. See, that's, a, that's such a great example because we're all walking around with these ideas about who we are. Mm -hmm. And every one of those ideas, I don't care how grand your idea is, you might walk around with the idea that you're the master of the universe. It's still a limiting concept. Mm -hmm. And so, what's again, what's nice about Zen is it helps loosen and create space around all those ideas that we have about ourselves. Right. And then sometimes we make these amazing discoveries like you did. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, when I let go of that, I can do things I never imagined I could do. Yeah. And I've had a couple of those experiences in you know, the past couple of years because I was backpacking for so long, not something I ever thought I would do. Mm -hmm. I was never part of the plan. And you know, eating all these crazy foods. When I grew up, the pickiest of eaters. <laughs> like, it was so ridiculous. To this day, anytime we have a family gathering, at some point it comes up in conversation about just how terrible it used to be to try to cook for me. Mm -hmm. It was just so awful. I made everyone's life hell. Someone trying to take me to a restaurant and be nice to me. And I was just like, I only wanted like a burger. And if there was anything like funny on it, I didn't mm -hmm. want any part of it. You're trying to make me, you know, we have a lot of family in the South. And so it's just very different styles of cooking. So for example, I remember getting fried okra. I'm like, explain to me what this is. You know, mind you, I'm like seven, eight years old. 
I have no concept of what okra is. Now I love it. I think it's great. But at the time, I was looking at it like, this is not peanut butter. I want to be a part of this. <laughs> Fast forward to when I'm 23 in Thailand, eating little bugs just because I thought it was funny. Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, in addition to any of the millions of other things that I ate just for survival, right? Because you're out there, my mom's not there to make me a peanut butter sandwich. I got to eat something. And so I've overcome a lot of that. But now I notice it in my friends, my family, when I tell them something crazy, which I, I do all the time. I always get these like crazy inspirations and these wild paths, and I want someone to do them with me. And the thing I hear all the time is, that's not me. I don't, I don't, I don't use float tanks, okay? <laughs> you know, whatever it is. I don't do jujitsu. And I always like, have to laugh now, because it's like I, I understand exactly what they mean because I've been there. I've done that where I'm like, no, I, I don't just go backpacking countries. I don't eat bugs, that's not me. But really what that means, at least in my interpretation, is I haven't done that. Mm-hmm. I've never done it in the past. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I will never do it. Which is so logical, you know? It's so normal to think that way. And like I said, I've done it. I've done it a million times in a million different ways. But then I see it in my friends, and um, I don't know what else to do but laugh. <laughs> like, I have, a, I have a roommate that, to this day, will not sit down to drink tea with me. And my only theory is that the first time he saw me do it, you know, this is my, my big teapot, but I have a smaller, nicer one at home. Mm-hmm. The first time he saw me do it, didn't get it, understandably. It's a weird thing to do. Mm-hmm. And then he's decided there he's not going to. So every time we talk about it now, he has a new excuse to back up the reason why he didn't do it the first time. So it's like, oh, it's hot? No, 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 it's too hot outside. And then it changed to, no, 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 I like milk in my tea. And then it changed to, you know, it, it keeps going. That's just supporting the rank he gave himself as man who does not drink tea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we do want to, we want to um, objectify ourselves. We want to make ourselves objects. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know why that is why our, you know, our imagination, and our consciousness works that way, but we do, you know, and uh, this, is, this is a place where I think Zen and, and some of the existentialist philosophers come together really well, like um, you might remember in our intro class together we studied Jean-Paul Sartre a little bit. I remember his name and that's about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well you might appreciate him more, at least that early Sartre that we talked about, because, you know, he, you know, he was convinced, at least on a a certain level, you know, that we are no thing, that we don't have, you know, any kind of fixed character, Mm. there's there's no fixed soul or fixed self of any kind. And for him, that translates into a radical freedom. You know, because there's, there's, there's nothing that has been, you know, determined about us in advance. No purpose that's been given to us. No, um, you know, no role that is final and definite and so on. But we don't really like this. Because it's, the correlation to that is, is to responsibility for what we do, for what we initiate, and right. so forth. And so if we objectify ourselves, then we can say, well, oh, I'm just not a tea person. (laughs) (laughs) Or, you know, I'm not a calculus person. I get this a lot at at USD. I'll have students say, well, I'm not a philosophy person. So, you know, I'll be happy if I can just kind of squeak through with this or that. And so they're basically what people are doing and I'm not uh, certainly not putting them down. We all do it at one point or another. Mm-hmm. Is we're we're basically sort of copying out, making this object you know uh, objectified view about ourselves, and then sort of hiding behind it or using it as an excuse. Right, an excuse that self perpetuates. Yeah. Like I can't start surfing. I'm not a surfer. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like, yeah. Well, that's how everyone started. Uh huh. Or um, the one that I've heard a lot, because I, I try to get everyone to do jujitsu. Uh, I think you should do it with me. I think <laughs> everyone watching should do it with me. <laughs> um, and the thing I hear all the time is, no, I'm not good at that. Like, 
Yeah, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. haven't taken a class. Like, why? Yeah. Why would you just be? No one's just good at it, right? Yeah. Like, no one. That I think that's how everything works. Like, I'm not good at speaking Chinese, for example, but only because I haven't taken the steps towards it. It doesn't mean that I could never be, but if I keep telling myself, no, nah, Chinese is not for me. I'm not a guy who speaks Chinese. I'm not a guy who dedicates myself. I'm lazy, I'm undisciplined, I'm very, very white. I can't just speak Chinese. It becomes true, mm -hmm. and it is true to this day. I know that this is a very real example for me, because <laughs> when I lived in Taiwan, I didn't, uh, I, I learned very little Chinese. Enough to tell a dirty joke. Did I could hear a dirty joke in Chinese? <laughs> sure. Okay. Me guo mei 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 o mao. Hao. Taiwan mei mei yo mao. Ta ma da hao. It rhymes. It's a dirty joke in Chinese. I won't translate it because you're a lady. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a joke I can tell all the cab drivers and they love it. I said it one time on stage at a comedy club and the Taiwanese staff loved it. Ah. But, um, you know, besides that joke, and certain tea phrases, you know, I can walk, I can, I know all the names of tea in Chinese, mm -hmm. and so I can go into a tea shop in Taiwan and talk shit about China, which makes them go, yeah, Chinese tea is bad, Taiwanese tea is good, he goes, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can do that, I can compliment his tea, mm -hmm. you can say, it's like a oolong cha, tomato hao, he goes, oh, tomato hao, and stuff like that, um, I don't know. I thought I had a point, but <laughs> start thinking about tea now. I just want to talk about tea. Yeah, <laughs> we were talking about again these limiting ideas that you mm. know I can't do. I can't speak Chinese. Or can't I can't do, do that. I can't gain weight. I'm skinny. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that a lot as well. Ah, I haven't had that thought for quite a while now. <laughs> <laughs> Most people haven't. That makes it hard for me to relate to people. But yeah. you know, it reminds me when you talk about that of something else that happens with the koan practice that you just began. Um, one of the things that is uh, a big barrier that people have to, to hurdle when they uh, start koan practices, they want to look good. Yes. Nobody <laughs> likes to go in and just completely, you know, fall on their butt, <laughs> you know, as they try to present the answer, what they think is the answer to the koan. Yeah, my first time presenting the answer, I was so confident. Mm -hmm. Like, I had the smartest, most clever answer. <laughs> and uh, it was so clever and so smart that Bear Roshi did not know that that was my answer. He thought we were just talking. <laughs> oh, so seamless, you know, yeah. so natural, <laughs> which can be very good things when you're presenting the answer to a koan, to have right. it very natural and integrated and so on. But I guess it wasn't the right answer because he told me <laughs> to go home and think about it. <laughs> but I know what you mean. You don't want to be the first person to storm the dance floor and then fall. Yeah. You don't want to show up at your jiu-jitsu tournament and get strangled. Exactly, and I've seen people, you know, drop out of koan practice because they can't stand the experience of, um, you know, not being able to succeed right away. Um, they think they're going to look foolish. You know, sometimes the answers to these koans are can, you know, from a, you know, from a non-Zen point of view, can look pretty foolish and pretty silly. Mm -hmm. Um, but people want to succeed, they want to look good, and that's another idea, you know, that we carry around, oh, we, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to look so great and look so smart and successful. Yeah, and I know part of it um, is you see people looking good, looking smart, mm -hmm. but what you can't see is what's inside their head, you can't see the self-doubt. And I've heard it in a saying before, it's one of those like, um, you know, on Facebook, a picture of Marilyn Monroe pops up with a quote. It's a quote, something along those lines, where it says, um, you often compare people's highlight reels to your behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. And so you're there, you know, I have the example of, um, I spent a lot of time in stand-up comedy open mics. I did it in Taiwan, I've come to some here. And when people think of stand-up comedy, they only think of the best. You know, they think like George Carlin and Bill Burr is like up there right now, Louis C.K., mm -hmm. they see them. And so they think, that if they just write down some funny stuff, they can just go on stage and be Louis C.K. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it a lot where people are like so confident right before, like, 
I got this. I have funny things. Because th- that, that's part of the truth of the matter is that everyone's funny. Everyone's funny enough to be a comedian. Everyone has funny thoughts. Everyone says funny things. At least everyone I've ever met. Mm-hmm. And, but when you go up there, it's a different animal. So you, you're seeing Louis C.K. destroy it. You know, he's done Madison Square Garden and like all these like huge places. And you go up there and open mic in front of seven people who aren't listening. Yeah. And they don't laugh for a lot of reasons. <laughs> maybe they're done laughing. Maybe they weren't listening. Maybe they have to fart and they don't want anyone to hear it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's so many reasons why it could go bad. And it crushes people. But what they don't know is that that happened to Louis C.K. That happened to George Carlin. Bill Burr has bombed more times than I ever will. Mm-hmm. You know, and so that, that's part of the problem as well. If I tell my friends to get into jujitsu. You know, I just posted these cool videos on Facebook of me competing last weekend. Uh, one of them I won, second one I lost, but I was winning at the time. So they can see that and say, wow, he did all these moves. I don't know any of those, therefore I should not start. Mm-hmm. And so that's a big thing that I've been trying to get over, you know. Like, um, you know, I have this book that I, 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 I mostly talk about it. I don't actually write it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I go through the self-doubt where I'm like, Hemingway's a good writer, and I can't do that. He's a badass man. I don't think I'm that badass. Therefore, I should just sit here and not write. <laughs> you know? yeah. All these things. When in reality, if I'd just done it, if I'd just gotten out of it, one thing I'd probably talk about it less. I think every episode of the podcast I've talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I keep, I keep um, my, my joke this morning was... Uh, the Tales of my Cock book coming out 2017. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be a while, especially the more I talk about it. But it's that, that whole point of just getting out of my way. If I stopped thinking about it, stopped, um, you know, thinking it has to be a certain quality, you know, it, any of these things, if I just wrote it, I'd at least be in a better position than I am now. Yeah, you don't know what would happen if you started writing. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the going back to Zen here, that's one of the beauties, beautiful things about Zen practice is that you you get comfortable being in the space of not knowing. Mm-hmm. And that's not, you know, being comfortable with ignorance. I mean, you can, you can know a lot of things and still be in a place of not knowing, which is a kind of, I think of as kind of an open place where you you have opened yourself up to whatever might occur. Right. And um, that's very hard for a lot of people. Yeah, the term that I've heard for that is the beginner's mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing in Zen is Mm -hmm. the mind of the beginner, not in terms of not knowing, but in terms of uh, few preconceived notions. You know, like if I go into a boxing gym, I don't know how to throw an uppercut. Mm-hmm. So if someone tells me, I will listen and take note much more so than a guy who thinks he already knows. Mm-hmm. You know, when you think you already know something and someone tries to explain it, stop listening. Yeah. You know, if someone came in, like, it happens to me um, <laughs> sometimes at the, when we meet on Mondays, uh, tea starts being talked about. And I'm like, I, I know about tea, all right, guys, don't come in here with their bullshit explanations poor is its own genre it's not green all right (laughs) any of these things like um because you know uh, recently one of the members brought in a cake of tea similar to this one Uh and i heard people discuss it i was like i don't need any part of this i'm not gonna bother telling you what it is is." (laughs) all these dumb things i should have done i'm sure maybe it was different tea i don't even know because i stopped listening Mm -hmm. i was the expert Mm -hmm. this man can teach me nothing (laughs) Which happens, happens in everything. Um, one of the, the most famous examples of a guy who embodies the beginner's mind is a fighter named George St. Pierre. Have you heard of this man? No, I don't know. Him. He was a longtime welterweight champion, the only champion to retire after a victory. You know, most fighters, they, they go until they just can't walk anymore. Mm-hmm. They go until someone has to tell them to stop. It's happened to Chuck Liddell. BJ Penn's on his fifth comeback. He's been knocked out the past couple times. Mm-hmm. It's usually a sad existence. George St. Pierre went out on top, and what they say about him is he's the only person to go 
ask a beginner what they're doing. And so there's a famous story where he saw this guy throwing a jab. You know, a jab is just the most simple of punches. Mm -hmm. It's pretty set in stone. It's been around for a long time. People know how to do it. And this guy, he's doing something weird. Like maybe his elbow was coming out. Maybe his shoulder was coming up first. Something bizarre about it to the point where he's being mocked in the gym. And George St. Pierre, at the time, he was the number one fighter in the world. He was champion of the division, had been for a long time. And he came up to this guy in the gym and said, like, what are you doing? And the guy said, I don't know, I just kind of, I just do this. And it was so weird, such a weird motion, so abnormal, because this guy's such a beginner, that George St. Pierre adopted it into his good technique in such a way that it threw people off. They didn't know what he was doing. Next thing you know, they get hit in the face. <laughs> And so, you know, it's maybe if his shoulder was coming up, that's not something anyone associates with a jab. It's something like that. Mm -hmm. But just that, that task of, you know, the, the, there's a beauty that comes when you're just beginning something, some yeah. naivety. And you can still be, you can be teachable. Right. You know, we forget about that, that we have to be teachable. And he was, at, even at his, you know, you know, even having this very high stature that he had. High as possible. As high, as high as he could get, he was still teachable. And that's marvelous. Right. Right. And so that's something I think about a lot because I feel like a beginner in everything. I'm not good at anything yet. And maybe one day I will be. But <laughs> I just keep thinking, like, so even at jiu-jitsu, and I just won all these matches this last weekend, but I still go to beginner's class, and I love rolling with um, people their first day because Bruce Lee mapped it out years ago that martial arts, and I think everything, the, the, the graph kind of goes like this. You start pretty low, but then you start to learn something, and you go lower because mm. you're thinking mm -hmm, about it. Mm -hmm. So you go lower, and then eventually you start rising again and get better. Mm. So in jiu-jitsu, you're better your first day than you are a month later. Just because you're overthinking everything, you're getting really self-conscious, you're like, I know what to do, but my body doesn't, there's a frustration. But the guy the first day, he's in just pure instinct and panic. And there's something beautiful about it. I've learned a lot from those guys. You know, there's something to it. In the same way, um, I don't know, I had a point. It's gone. Really <laughs> yeah, um, so we've been talking for about 45 minutes or so. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about in particular. Any mm. plug? Any, any uh, plug? words of wisdom for the community? Well, I would plug Three Treasures and Community. Three Treasures and Community? It's How can people find out about it? TTZC.org. TTZC.org. And we meet in uh, the Rancho Penasquitos area of San Diego. Every Monday. Every Monday. It's a very welcoming group. I can testify. I go there. I love <laughs> it. Um, sit down, meditate. It's awesome. It's a welcome. And we have kind of a sister sangha in Vista. Okay. Also, the Vista Zen Center. And I'm not sure what their web address is, but you could easily find it. And uh, uh, my Dharma brother, uh, Jake G. Gage Roshi, is the is the head teacher there. Uh, if you're they in have San a Diego, wonderful, they have a wonderful group. If you're in San Diego, you want to meditate, come meditate with her. If you're <laughs> elsewhere, look up your local Zen center. Or don't. You'd be okay. <laughs> but I would recommend meditation to everyone. Because in, in my mind, it's up there with nutrition and exercise in terms of things that have been proven scientifically to be beneficial. How beneficial, I don't really know. But you can't really say you're outside of it like I, I don't need nutrition mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. kind of a silly thing to say now like i don't need to exercise the most fit person on earth still needs to exercise the most unfit person on earth could still use some exercise that's why it makes sense to me um so if you're listening and you have never meditated before i would say the best place to start please correct me if i'm wrong sit down 10 minutes count your breath see how it goes there's no goal, there's no way to mess it up. See how it goes. Which I guess is kind of the point, right? Just to, to observe, to see. Yeah, but. well, I, I think there are lots of points to it that 
I think your advice is good. And, and also, we're living in a time now where there's so many great resources available. Right. You know, there, <coughs> there are, again, places to go, Zen centers, um, uh, Vipassana groups. Right. There are, you know, meditation groups from all, all different faiths and, and uh, traditions. And there's a lot of media out there that's really great, like the uh, um, Joseph Goldstein and, um, oh, wonderful person, woman. I'm just blanking on her name, just having a senior moment here. <laughs> but they're, you know, so they have a, a, a great package on insight meditation that would, that's wonderful to start with. Right. Yeah. No excuses, guys. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much for sitting here with me. Tales of Macaque Podcast, Episode 4. I think we're done. You're thank welcome. you for joining me. <laughs> and thank you, Marshall. <laughs> All right.